In a previous video on this snapper mower, we took our first look at it after picking it up off the curb. Now it's in pretty good shape despite its age, but after a good cleaning, it looked better than ever. However, we found out that looks can be deceiving because it suffered some damage during its years of service and the method they used to deal with it pretty much sealed its fate. What's up everyone and thank you for stopping by. Today's project is a snapper lawnmower and the problem is that it's very hard to start and when it finally tries to start, it stumbles quite a bit. Now, I'm going to try and repair this mower, however, it may not be the exact repair you need to make to yours. We'll explore other options later in the video. Now, we're only going to mention what these other options could be. We don't have enough time to look into them, but if you need more information on these options, you're welcome to ask as many questions as you need to. At some point, there must have been a problem with the friction disc drive system, and for some reason, the previous owner decided to remove the damaged parts and make the mower a push mower, which is perfectly fine. However, the parts I need to replace to make the self-propel work again are quite expensive, so I'm not going to be able to fix it. I haven't decided whether or not I'm going to remove the rest of the drive system just yet. I'm waiting to see if I can find a parts mower, and if that happens, I'm going to need all these parts. If I can find one for less than $50, I think I'll be able to fix the self-propel on this mower. Now, the next scenes are from the previous video where I try to start it and fail, but this will be our baseline to compare to, hopefully after fixing its hard starting issue. As you'll see, it takes multiple attempts before I get it started. As you can tell from the video, it's very hard to start and it took several tries before it finally started and it's also not a very smooth start either. Now since this carb uses a primer to push fuel into the carb's throat, we need to make sure it's working like it should. The sticker shows that we only need to press it three times, but is that enough fuel to start the engine? Over time, leaky gaskets can cause the primer system to not push as much fuel as it's supposed to, so that's the first thing I want to check. Now the easiest way to check is to remove the air filter and look into the intake for the carb. We'll then be able to see roughly how much fuel comes out of the carb to help start the engine. It looks as though they bought the wrong filter for this carb because it looks like they had to close off a hole at the top of it. As you can see, there is indeed a hole at the top of the filter. Now this is not going to cause any problems and what they did to fix it is perfectly fine. The strange thing is I can't seem to find the right filter for this engine either, so if you know the right part number, I'd really appreciate it. Now the side chute is so large that it's in my way, so to make filming a little bit easier, I'm going to remove it. Now this way, I'll be able to move the camera right above the intake to the carb. So here's what it looks like down inside the intake, and as you can see, this is what it looks like before we press the bulb. If we press the bulb a few times, you can see that some fuel will start to coat the inside of the intake, but it's really not that much. However, if we press it a few more times, you can see there's a small pool of fuel at the bottom of the intake, which is probably too much. So it's quite easy to flood this carb. What that means is that this primer works just like it should, and this is not the cause for our hard starting issue. The next thing I want to check is the spark plug and see if there's a lot of carbon buildup on it, or if the air gap has gotten too large, making it harder for the spark to jump across. So it looks to be okay, but for some reason, the opposite side does have some carbon buildup on it. Even though this isn't normal, it's really not going to get in the way of the spark jumping across the air gap. The next thing I want to check is the air gap using my feeler gauges, and what I'm trying to do is find out which shim will fit with minimal drag between the electrode and the ground, and it turns out the one that fits is the 24 thousandths of an inch shim. Now I do believe it's supposed to be larger than this, so more than likely someone's already closed the gap to try and get it to start better, but as you just saw earlier, it didn't seem to help. The next thing I want to do is use my spark plug tester to see what the spark looks like at the tip of the plug. So I turned the dial to about 3000 RPMs and the spark plug worked just fine. What that means is I don't think the spark plug is our problem. What I'm going to do though is I'm going to give it a good cleaning. That way I can see if the carbon buildup will come back again. 
Now you don't need to use a propane torch to clean it. I'm sure you can use other methods to get rid of the carbon. I just prefer this method because I like the results I get with it. Now just be very careful because you can accidentally start a fire or burn yourself. So if you don't want to take this sort of risk, I'm sure you can get great results with some carb cleaner and a wire brush. Once you finally get all the carbon gone, I'm going to let it sit for several minutes to make sure I don't burn myself. The other option is to, of course, just replace the spark plug, but if you can't get a replacement in a timely fashion, then cleaning the plug is your next best option. As you can see, it looks a whole lot better now than when we first started. I'll check it again once the engine's got a few more hours on it and see if the carbon comes back. If you do replace your spark plug, I would suggest replacing it with an OEM plug and stay away from generics if possible. The next thing I want to check is the valve lash, and to do that we need to remove the valve cover. I've been told these engines need to have their valve lash checked once in a while, and there's a good chance this one hasn't been checked in a long time, so it might be out of tolerance. Now, once the valve cover is off, I'm going to stick my screwdriver in the spark plug hole so I can feel the top of the piston, and then rotate the blade so that the piston is at the top of its travel in the cylinder on the compression stroke. Now, with the intake valve closed, just use the screwdriver to feel when the piston is as far forward as it can be without starting to move backwards down the cylinder. Once the piston is at top dead center on the compression stroke, we're now ready to check the valve lash. Now the valve lash is the clearance between the valve tappet and the rocker arm. If that clearance is off, it can affect how the engine starts and runs. I'm hoping to see that it is out of tolerance because that could be causing our hard starting issue. The first thing I'm going to do is use a six thousandths of an inch shim, which is the upper limit for the lash. So it should just fit with a little bit of drag, but what I'm seeing is it's quite loose in both the intake and the exhaust. That means the gap is much bigger than the shim, which is not good and it's out of tolerance. Just for fun, I'm going to try to figure out how out of tolerance it actually is. I'm just going to keep increasing the thickness of each shim till I find the one that won't fit, and to save time, I'm going to jump a few sizes instead of going in order. Then I can start reducing the thickness until I find the one that barely fits. I finally got to the 15 thousandths of an inch shim and I wasn't able to slide it in on the intake rocker, so that means it has to be less than 15 thousandths of an inch. Unfortunately, this shim was able to slide under the exhaust rocker arm, so that means we'll have to keep increasing the shim thickness on this one till we find the one that won't fit. Next, I'm going to pick the 12 thousandths shim to use on the intake since we know it has to be between 11 and 15 thousandths. Now once I have it between the tappet and the rocker arm, I can feel just a bit of drag and you can see the mower moving a bit as I slide it around. That means the clearance for this intake is 12 thousandths, which is far too much. Now that we know what the valve lash is for the intake, we need to find out what the exhaust is. I'm going to use the 17 thousandths shim this time, and as you can see, it slides right under the rocker arm with ease, which means we'll need to increase the shim size yet again. This time, I'm going to use the 19 thousandths. And it looks like we finally found the size that won't fit, which is the 19 thousandths. Since we know the 17 fits, that means the clearance has to be 18 thousandths, which it is. The next thing we need to do is make our adjustments to bring it back to tolerance. We need to put a wrench on the adjusting nut and then loosen the Torx bolt in the middle. Once that's done, we can now easily turn the adjuster. The shim I'm going to be using will be the 5 thousandths, which is right in the middle of the tolerance. That way we have some wiggle room if we don't get it exact. What I like to do is slide the shim under the rocker arm and then turn the adjuster till I feel the shim drag between the rocker arm and the tappet. I'll then tighten the Torx bit to lock it into place. Then I'll check the clearance once again just to make sure it's right. However, as I check it a second time, it doesn't feel the same like it did before I tightened the Torx bolt, so I'm going to adjust it one more time and then check it again. And this time, it feels a whole lot better. Next, I'm going to do the same thing to the exhaust rocker arm. I'm not sure why, but sometimes after tightening the Torx bolt, it will sometimes change the setting, so checking it afterwards is always recommended. Once I'm done making my adjustments, I'm going to do one last check, and once I'm satisfied with it, I'm going to replace the valve cover and the bolts for it. I think it's safe to assume that this engine has never had a valve lash inspection, and that's why it's so far out of tolerance. Of course, the other option is someone tried to adjust it and just did it incorrectly. Now, the valve lash is very important when it comes to an overhead valve engine, and with it being this far off, it would definitely have an effect on how this engine starts and runs, so I'm pretty certain that this is the reason why this engine is having a hard time starting. So another option as to why this engine would be hard to start is if the mower hits something like a large rock or a stump while in use. What typically happens is that the key on the flywheel will shear and allow the magnets on the flywheel to be in a slightly different position in relation to the crank, and it makes it harder for the engine to start. Once everything is back together, I'm going to try and start it, and hopefully it starts a lot easier than the last time. 
Now the air temperature is about 42 degrees, so I'm going to press the bulb five times to compensate for the cold weather. So it looks like that was definitely our problem as it started on the first pull this time and it didn't stumble like it did last time. There was still a small amount of black smoke from the muffler but that's more than likely from me pressing the bulb more than I needed to. Now when the weather is warmer and you're starting the engine for the first time, three presses on the bulb should be more than enough. Now to be honest, I'm quite surprised that the engine even ran, let alone start with the valve lash being so far off, but at least we got it starting and running better, and hopefully this mower will continue to work for several more years, although I wouldn't want to use it for too long until I got the self-propel working again. So my question is, if you have a mower with an overhead valve engine, when was the last time you checked the valve lash? To be honest, I only check mine when I have a problem starting it or if I have a running issue, and most people wouldn't care about such things, so I'd imagine it rarely gets checked. Thank you for watching. I really do appreciate your time here. Please feel free to ask me any questions, and I hope to see you in the next video.